Hello, everyone, and welcome to Live Academy, the virtual design learning platform by Meal Middle East Architecture Lab. My name is Riyad Jokha. I'm logging in from Dubai, and I'll be the moderator for today's public lecture. This is a keynote lecture and the final lecture of our semester, semester three on Live Academy. The lecture is given by Nada Tehrani, the founding principal of Nada and the dean of the Cooper Union School of Architecture. If you haven't already, please check out the last few classes we have on uh, Live Academy. We have a couple of technical classes that might be interesting uh, to you. Uh, you can check out those classes on www.liveacademy.tv. I'm very grateful and honored that Nader has made uh, time to present uh, to us his uh, work and discourse uh, of his practice, uh, Nada. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, seeing a lecture by Nader in Hong Kong and in Beirut, and, by, and to also visit some of his work, uh, namely the Aesop uh, interior uh, project we were just talking about. Um, Nada is a Boston-based uh, architecture and urban design firm led by Principal Nada Tehrani. Uh, Tehrani leads a studio with partner Arthur Chang, AIA, who also leads the studio fabrication shop, Nad Lab. Nada is a platform for design investigation at large scale with a great geographic reach. Nada's work has been exhibited in institutions, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Boston Institute of Contemporary Art, the LA MOCA, and is part of the permanent exhibit of the NASHA and the CCA. For the past seven years in a row, Nada has ranked in the top 11 design firms in Architects Magazine top 50s firms in the United States, ranking as first three years in a row. And Nada's uh, biography is very expansive, so I've made a shorter version uh, to read out for you guys. For his contributions to architecture as an art, Nada Tahani is a recipient of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Uh, 2020 Arnold uh, W. Brunner uh, Memorial Prize. Nader Tehrani is the founding principal of NADA, practice dedicated to the advancement of design innovation, interdisciplinary collaboration, and an intensive dialogue with the construction industry. He is also the dean of the Erwin S. Channon School of Architecture at the Cooper Union. Tehrani's work has been recognized with notable awards, including the Cooper Hewitt National Design Award, in architecture, the United States Artist Fellowship in Architecture and Design, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Awards in Architecture. He has also received the Halston Parker Award and the Hobson Award. Throughout his career, Tehrani has received 18 Progressive Architecture Awards, as well as numerous national and international design awards. He served as the Frank O'Gary International Visiting Chair in Architectural Design at the University of Toronto and the inaugural uh, Paul uh, Helme, uh, fellow at the uh, California State Polytechnic University. He has also uh, uh, served as the William Bernoudi Architect in Residence at the American Academy in Rome. I'm very excited for today's uh, public lecture, this keynote lecture by Nader Tehrani, Principal of Nada. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you very much for the kind um, introduction. Um, uh, this talk, uh, goes by two titles, uh, Probable Architectures of Improbable Reason, uh, as well as the Sixth Elevation. They deal uh, with uh, uh, an emerging set of problems that uh, we faced um, uh, in our early career uh, and that uh, of the ceiling. Uh, the fundamental um, uh, challenges of the architect uh, revolving around the question of construction uh, and the historical um, uh, separation uh, for, uh, of the architect from the builder uh, and how to overcome that uh, crisis. Uh, essentially, with the designer being in charge of the design intent, the architect being in charge of the design intent, and the contractor, the means and methods of, of design, this uh, separation has castrated uh, the relationship between design ideas and their construction deployment. Uh, and so uh, in the context of mantra, this very uh, sort of um, uh, a small restaurant that we were designing, uh, we were commissioned to design a hookah den within a 6,000 square foot project for which the hookah den had somehow emerged to uh, represent 80% of that budget. And that was just unacceptable for us. So we, we figured out a way to build it ourselves by um, essentially gluing the 
plan onto the ceiling, uh, dropping plumb bobs and exacting the locations of the intersecting connections between the plywood, uh, essentially enabling us to make it for a tenth of the cost that was proposed and uh, with a profit and then attending to the rest of the project around it for the rest of the, uh, for the, rest of the budget. And so this engagement uh, of the architect with construction uh, became a formative and critical part uh, of our early years in design. This project is over 20 years old, but central to the thinking that we've now taken to a, a larger uh, engagement with the construction industry. Uh, naturally within this, uh, there is a focus in our practice on the way in which we can radicalize material usage, but also its figuration and how that material begins to um, uh, engage uh, people, um, uh, symbolism, uh, and, and the various ways in which matter can speak. On, on the left side, of course, we can see the way in which the sculpting of that brick is wholly indifferent to the constitution uh, of its bonding. And on the right, we can see that there's a more elusive, maybe more abstract uh, figuration that happens, but that is the result of that bonding itself. Um, in the context of this talk, uh, the ambitions of that ceiling uh, or the dome uh, that we know of historically is uh, further compromised by the inevitable engagement with systems of fire suppression, lighting, uh, mechanical functions of heating and cooling, uh, and thus the aspirational aspect of that which we learn from history are rarely transferable to the projects that we work on today. So in great part, this is also trying to uh, bring out of, of uh, the archives, uh, the kind of mundane relationship to the reflected ceiling plan. That reflected ceiling plan may be the most important aspect of architecture today, because if you do not control it, uh, in fact, you will uh, become its victim. So uh, much of the work that we do revolves around not general ideas, but rather the generative detail. Now, the moment in which a particular materiality or uh, a way of its conception, uh, the detailing can become deployed through and throughout uh, as part and parcel uh, of the project. In this case, um, the Tenderum Bridge, which connects the Yarra River to their um, uh, tennis open uh, grounds, is a pedestrian bridge uh, that is designed uh, conceptually wholly of rebar, understanding that the bending of rebar uh, at different angles uh, has a mode uh, and a means and methods all of its own. And trying to develop a structural system that has the redundancy of latticing laterally and longitudinally was central to this conception. In other words, uh, instead of seeing a primary structure with skin around it, uh, imagining a bowstring truss that uh, evolves somehow with the maximum moment being at the center of its belly uh, and developing through the braiding of that rebar, this vast trellis that speaks to the experience of walking underneath it while also uh, acknowledging that two weeks out of the year, one is above that uh, skyline uh, and, and, and sees the horizon uh, of Melbourne with uh, the lighting, the, the guards, the railing as part of this experience. And so this idea of the wrapping of the rebar as a structural system uh, was a central part of uh, this uh, small folly in, in Melbourne. Now, conceptually, uh, you can see here that the ideas that are somehow woven into our work uh, are both top down and bottom up. Uh, the bowl and the nest in, in this image are effectively the same. Uh, what the bowl does is that it erases the evidence of its construction through its abstraction, whereas the nest in the display of the blades of grass and the uh, twigs and, and the detritus uh, shows us how 
the combinatory effects of, of all of these aggregates produce that vessel. And in which case, uh, also underscore the possibility of becoming, that that could have been formed into different figures, not just the bowl. So um, before I get to the main projects, I wanted also to somehow do an introduction that amplifies the many ways in which uh, this thinking has found itself into some of our larger projects, uh, but also uh, ways in which we've con uh, construed the construction industry as part of that challenge. In the context of the Melbourne School of Design, we found ourselves with a scheme of designing um, the studio space as a vertical chamber within which all of the students come together uh, and uh, form an allegiance in the design hall with a dedicated design studio and a suspended studio from the top that uh, is a totemic object, much like the tempietto or the staircase in the British arts or the central uh, meeting room in um, Frank Gehry's Berlin building, albeit with a different aspirational quality. In these instances, the relationship between the figure and the ground uh, the monument and the fabric around it is more or less disengaged. We asked ourselves a different question. What would it mean if the structure of the ceiling were the host of this figure and therefore confluenced with it? In other words, knowing that we were needed to span 22 meters, how would we develop lateral bracing through coffers that are about three meters deep and then suspend the dedicated studio spaces from that in massive timber elements that hang one, two, and then three stories down, but not touch the ground and hover over a more flexible ground in which the atrium may op operate as a, essentially a living room for the school, but then invert the proposition of a classical building that is usually foundationed on the ground and then built up and lightened up. This has its mass at the top getting skinnier and skinnier uh, as it uh, gets suspended from top down. And in this sense, the veneer of that very structure acquires a structural quality as it's suspended over the floor. And so from the top conceived of as uh, massive timber elements that are glued together to form the truss, the coffered frame above, uh, is then incrementally suspended down, finally revealing the edge of its plywood as it goes down. At the top, you, uh, you inhabit that coffering system. Those uh, coffered spaces are really the spaces of the studio at the top. And by the time you get to the bottom, you are occupying uh, the space of the acoustic baffles that are underneath that suspended studio in their three quarter inch thinness. And so the, the presence of that ceiling, the reflected ceiling plan and their performative functions, whether acoustic or structural are part of uh, the way in which we've absorbed the responsibilities of the designer in its construction. A similar thing can be said of the uh, Daniel's Faculty of Architecture, where we look back uh, on the work of Felix Candela, knowing that uh, concrete shell structures uh, allow for uh, an incredible variety of spans, uh, efficient in, in their thickness, uh, while also engaging in larger propositions about how the hydrology and the daylighting of spaces may work. And so we absorb that as part of our thinking of the Daniels building in the conception of its studio space. In this case, on the third floor of the building at the top, drawing in uh, from that structural system, natural daylighting and a way of distributing the water all around the site to irrigate the landscape. Alas, our contractors told us that this was unbuildable, unachievable, and that it was a million dollars over. And we had to go back to the drawing boards and think, why is it that there's this incredulity in our ability to build this thing? Uh, 
it's a concrete building and therefore it should be achievable. But we all know that concrete buildings are, are built twice. Uh, the formwork is one instantiation of that building, the concrete is a second, and then the, the dismantling of the formwork essentially is the uh, byproduct of that and, and usually gone to waste. So we asked ourselves, what would it mean to build the entire building out of concrete, except for the roof that we could build out of a stick system? By building it out of a stick system, we could demonstrate that it's a ruled surface and therefore developable. And instead of using gypboard or sheetrock uh, on that ceiling, we can um, use a, 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 um, a panel within which uh, we can embed the cooling system. In other words, where the heating is embedded in the concrete of the ground, the cooling uh, is in a um, panel system that uh, transmits the cooling systems from top down. And by doing that, we were able to create a low resolution version of that same curvature from which would be suspended uh, the elements that create a smooth surface uh, from the sheetrock system. And this uh, paneling system now uh, uh, becomes part uh, uh, of that um, uh, conception of the Daniels building. Now, the two projects I'm gonna show today uh, really are uh, on the opposite uh, ends of the spectrum. Uh, one is a public project um, over which we have very limited control because of its uh, 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 requirements of public participation and uh, designing in groups and committees. The other one is a bespoke house by a single client and the negotiations of historic preservation and other things that deal with the, the city, but essentially centralized through one character. In the context of the Adams Library, which is now under construction, almost complete, the planning took over a year of negotiation and the participatory design with both um, uh, community members, librarians, senior leaders, uh, adolescents, and even kids, bringing them into focus groups and realizing that there was no form that was architectural uh, in, in a way that could capture the way in which they were diagramming uh, their site. What we did know and understand was that they needed the library to be on a single fl a floor. They needed a central uh, location of control for the control of books and people. And we needed to separate uh, the adults from the adolescents from the kids. And so this tripartite fingering uh, uh, of the scheme in part reflects the way in which the planning was conceived. The building is also about uh, a single story building whose roof is viewed from all of its neighborhood uh, because most of the neighborhood is triple deckers and four story buildings looking down upon this building. And so the roof, which is the fifth elevation is very much in view uh, and is part of this narrative. Now, conceptually, the main street uh, of that building is its storefront and conceptually it's thought of as a stoa opening up the front of the library to that space. And indeed, we use a civic, a large order to reflect the scale of the monumentality or the civicness of that front while breaking down that very same scale towards the rear where we create a pedestrian passage that connects to the residential um, uh, neighborhoods in the back reflective of the breakdown of roof scales behind. The orders of the class, the classical orders are broken down and unrolled in that storefront on one side uh, here under construction, while the back is then uh, becomes the, the vessel for all of the irrigation uh, for the promenade that goes towards the east. And there you can see the breakdown of that roof line parcelized in relationship to each of the programs that it uh, captures. In other words, each pitch of each roof uh, is aligned with either a, the office of a librarian, a storage room, 
uh, an auditorium or the kids area, uh, the scuppers of which capture the water and then bring it into the rain garden here also under construction. The hydrology of course is uh, also uh, works in tandem with its relationship to the sun. Uh, the sun being on of course the southern side in a mat building needs to excavate the core of the building to bring maximum light, particularly in the winter months to uh, gain from the thermal mass of the floor, the heating that it requires for the day. And so the overhangs in a way reflect uh, how that um, both gets protected and uh, invites the sun into the space. And then maybe one of the more telling aspects of this project is a, um, um, a pragmatic uh, Yankee tradition of brick-sided um, buildings that reserve the classical orders, if you will, the monumental orders and the rich materials uh, for the front while putting either clapboard or brick on the side and very uh, 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 sort of uh, unceremoniously link these two facades together on the, on the oblique. And we tap into this tradition in a way to transform the civic structure into something quotidian uh, using terracotta uh, with a, a kind of deep uh, dark eggplant uh, harking back to uh, Greek vases on the one hand with the natural terracotta and the white glaze on the other side. So the finishes that you see here are in part a reflective of a kind of grounding order of that terracotta which speaks to the brick in Boston. Um, the, the natural aspects are really have to do with a southern and northern garden, the northern garden with the existing oak tree the Southern with a, a series of new plantings that we bring to draw in the light uh, for uh, uh, the reading rooms, one in the South and one in the North. Here again, under construction. The reflective ceiling plan, of course, is the occasion for this discussion and the way in which the, the civic order is then ruled down into the domestic scale of each program towards the back uh, of the building. And, and in great part, this is rendered through a structural sy system that spans from the west facade all the way to the east with acoustic baffles that fill in the spaces between them with lighting, uh, mechanical systems, all exposed on the ceiling. There is no ceiling here. Everything is raw and open such that the shelving and the chairs run north-south with the uh, structural systems and all other systems running uh, perpendicular uh, in the other direction. So uh, in essence, this diagram uh, is here captured uh, through this animation, showing the, the kind of synthesis of all of this thinking uh, in one diagram, uh, the civic order in the front, uh, the casual uh, daily promenade uh, in the back, the breakdown of the two scales, uh, the roof as a fifth elevation, uh, uh, holding the water as a vessel towards the east, the excavation of the south uh, to a loggia in the north, drawing in the natural light, um, and the two gardens, one in the south, one in the north, uh, the insertion of three areas of reading for the adults, the children, uh, and, and the adolescents with the structural system weaving perpendicular to it. And then the experience of that space uh, effectively uh, as the human subject woven in between those two grains. Here, the grain of the ground reinforcing its connection to the sun and the gardens and the ceiling documenting the mapping of that civic order to the domestic. Now, this same kind of thinking uh, finds itself in, in some of our smaller projects where known typologies are reconfigured in relationship to forces from the site uh, and externalities that impact uh, the way that a simple courtyard building may work in relationship to its context. In this case, uh, an opulent uh, site in Southern 
uh, France overlooking the Mediterranean finds, it, finds itself actually uh, curiously cramped by the neighbors that are both uh, towards its north and its south. The configuration of this house finds itself as a courtyard building that slipped in relationship to a sloped uh, landscape, uh, essentially taking advantage of its courtyard to insert a pool in there that is completely protected from public view while ensuring that both the upper level living room and the lower level bedrooms have a great view uh, of the Mediterranean beyond. So the diagram of this building essentially acknowledges the odd configuration of the site, the best views that can be drawn from that, both monumental and individual. Uh, it acknowledges also the topography of the site not being flat, slipping that typology and inserting two stairs at the corners that connect the loop together, but also the way in which Western views towards the Pinus Pinei may yield a cross draft that is central for uh, the ability of this to work in a sustainable way, drawing in the landscape, inserting the promenade right into it and going above towards the West. Uh, the building now built uh, of a, a kind of monolithic concrete. There's a material conversation that I'll get into later, but uh, a front facade, which is a structure, in fact, cantilevered overhead that embraces the promenade as you go up uh, and under and through uh, this landscape to arrive at the core space, which is the protected zone of the courtyard that looks beyond towards uh, the Mediterranean. Um, uh, as I said before, the, the uh, top level uh, is essentially an open living room with uh, amazing views uh, of both the East and the West. And the master suite is also on that level, uh, embracing the landscape that is the, uh, where the front courtyard is. Uh, but the entry, the formal entry is also on that second level. So you can come up the stairs and as you go through the front door, uh, essentially you're faced with this um, uh, view uh, uh, of the Mediterranean uh, that is like a case study house, except its views are not only open to one side, but we lift the roof from the opposite side, uh, again, maximizing not only the light and the air from one side, but creating a roof uh, that is not only spanning laterally, but also longitudinally. Think Kimball Arts Museum here. Uh, remembering that this is a dramatic site, that there are drops of over 30 feet in the landscape and the uh, saving of those trees is part of a kind of natural commitment to its, the heritage of the site uh, and that the framing of those same views is really part of the environment uh, of this house. Those trees are kind of surreal elements in the background, but very much part of its daily life and a landscape that anybody from the Middle East uh, should know from uh, around the Mediterranean. Again, the folded roof in this case is now triangulated in relationship to the forces of drainage and, uh, and the lighting from one side and the other, uh, and then effectively seen only from the top as one overlooks uh, the horizon from an up. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the building is not just a courtyard, it's actually a structural system that supports itself. The retaining wall, that supports the swimming pool is the same wall that intercepts the front facade to cantilever it out. So thus, both that structure and the stairs form a cantilever that suspends um, uh, that front facade while allowing uh, the circulation uh, in the basement uh, to have, get cool and warm light uh, at the same time. The warm light is coming from the east and the cool light through the pool to the west. And the cadence and the syncopation of that uh, is a central part of the experience of going to each of these bedrooms. The bedrooms are then 
located uh, at, at the garden level with uh, wooden trellises that both guard it uh, from a security perspective, but also um, from the harsh sun uh, when there's direct sun beyond curtains. There's also these louvers. And uh, the standard room essentially comes with a series of layers, uh, a sheer curtain, uh, a blackout shade that goes behind that, the glazing, uh, the wood uh, uh, sort of trellis system, and of course the unmediated relationship to the landscape beyond one step up to use the step up both as storage and seating for the bedroom itself. Uh, this is very much a landscape project, obviously, that uh, the, the expression of the crust of the roof is also an extension of what we see as the landscape coming into the house and over and onto it. And so uh, its uh, construction, though in concrete, is really meant to meld into that landscape. The question of concrete, of course, is a difficult one, um, more common in Europe, certainly, than in the US. Uh, this house being in France was the first time we'd actually built in concrete. And we realized that it's the one medium whose expression uh, is the result of liquid and the very formwork that makes up uh, its uh, vessel. So the expression is either in the plywood or the aluminum that is its formwork or uh, through post-production work uh, can be hammered out of it uh, to give that expression. And we've seen beautiful fabric form work, both historically from Fizak and onwards to contemporary work. So we tried one strategy whereby we would draw in rustication from that smooth surface uh, to speak to the landscape in a much more aggressive way, uh, looking at the smoothness of that front facade, but using the entry to rusticate essentially that uh, effect of entering in the depth of that carving being expressed. And yet we found that almost um, too overtly representational. So we went back and we said, what is a second modality in which we could investigate uh, the material transformation of concrete? And really the answer was in the aggregate itself. Our concrete is never a single material. It, is, uh, it, it has um, cement, it has, uh, sometimes admixtures and aggregates of different sizes, uh, what would it mean to begin to challenge the size of those aggregates in the way that somebody like Wright may have done? But reserving the smooth for the interior and then casting in each different panel varied sizes of those very aggregates that may shift the figure ground of that wall to become a stone wall using the concrete merely as mortar in between holding a classical stone wall in the landscape together as if it was a natural extension of the French landscape. And this transformation is a central part uh, of the conception of this house. Alas, this was not to be built this way because in fact, uh, even uh, projects of some complexity have budgets and so uh, what ended up happening is that we realized that the aggregate uh, of the site has this reddish amber hue to it. And the sheer beauty of that color is something to behold in itself. And all we really needed to do was to sandblast the wooden formwork to let the sun do its work through the pores and the grain uh, of that um, surface. And so I'll end with this idea of the tectonic grain, uh, which has not to do only with the facts of construction, but how we would like the building to be read in dialogue with tectonics. Um, when we look at nature and we witness the graining uh, of the striping of zebras among other animals, we take for granted the way in which they attempt to camouflage themselves within that savanna. As I change the slide, we realize that this initial slide is in fact errant. Uh, the striping uh, of the zebra 
runs perpendicular to the torso and the legs and the architecture that holds them together is the turning of the corner when the legs conjoin with the torso. But this reminds us that the work uh, of the architect is never natural uh, and that uh, the artifice of design is what makes the tectonic rain, uh, which makes for us uh, uh, a beautiful arena within which we get to play on the one hand, but also to hold the responsibilities that come with the design process. So with that, uh, I thank you and I uh, certainly uh, encourage um, questions should there be any. Thank you so much, Nadir. That was such a packed lecture. I mean, there were so many ideas there and so many, uh, you know, great examples of your work, but also uh, it's really amazing to hear the process behind uh, your thinking. And maybe I'll start the conversation going, Nadir, with the, the idea of the roof. So we were talking about uh, the roofs of the markets in Kashan. In your opinion, past the pragmatic functions of a roof, which we're all familiar with, a lot of these uh, buildings that you've shown have this, the roof function as almost the most celebrated aspect of the building. In your opinion, uh, past that pragmatic function of uh, you know holding shelter and uh, at the same time you know uh, hosting all the mechanical works and electrical works of what makes a building. Uh, how do you think a, a roof could be uh, also an essential expression in the building? I mean, obviously the expression of all of these projects is in great part contained within the ceiling and the roof uh, in, in varied forms. Obviously the roof uh, in the library plays a more formative role. I didn't really show an aerial, aerial view of it, but it's insinuated by it. My focus was on the ceiling, but it, it plays a formative role. Uh, there are uh, other projects like the Daniels building has a, a, a very sculpted roof that is part of the skyline of of uh, Spadina North. Mm -hmm. um, so part of the roof, as we well know, is in giving identity to a city. Uh, there is no such thing as Florence without a Duomo. Right. Uh, you know, there is no such thing uh, as um, as, uh, as as you know, the the, the main square in Isfahan without looking at the two domes of the mosques on one end and lateral across, across from Ali Rapu. So these um, uh, form very strong symbolic anchors around both cities and squares. But in our case, the terms and conditions uh, under which those would be formed have changed fundamentally because of the ways in which the roof is called on, the ceiling, the, the, the crust is called on to house all of these systems. And, and in those systems, when unattended, essentially become um, so burdened mm -hmm. by multiple disciplines whose care for architecture is not equatable with that of the, the main designer, that if you don't coordinate them and if you don't own them, if you don't uh, end up uh, completely designing them, uh, they, they effectively leave the project um, fundamentally compromised. So part of our agenda has been to A, first and foremost, to, is a kind of a process of acknowledgement that ceilings and roofs are, are never one. They're delaminated. There's a series of laminates. Uh, there's what you see from below, there's what you see from above, and there's the many layers that need to be negotiated by the different um, consultant teams and the trades in between there. Mm -hmm. uh, controlling that roof and that ceiling may be all that you need to do for those civic projects is what my claim is. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, one may bury that, that equation and say that there is, you know, there are buildings that you know, where the facade is its main instrument of communication. And, and that, that still is important. Uh, and, uh, and we acknowledge that. But I think that 
the most architects um, have left the problem of the ceiling to be designed by convention, which is why we see the population of so much detritus of diffusers and safety systems up there. And so to me, it's really important that we transform our own identity as designers by uh, taking on this problem wholesale. It's both a technical and a symbolic problem at the same time. Uh, and by also changing the attitude of society, meaning the construction trades, the contractors and clients to recognize what, uh, that that's not an engineering problem, essentially, that's an architectural. Absolutely. And um, kind of a follow-up question, but also a second question. Uh, in a lot of your buildings that you showed today, you have this celebrated moment, uh, sort of feature, so to speak, uh, that you, you, you invest a bit of uh, experimental research and materiality or of aesthetic of some sort or, or some experience of some sort. Uh, how do you manage to convince the client that this is an investment worth taking? It's a tough one and sometimes you fail. I mean, I, uh, as you may know, you've also worked with uh, other places like shop that have a lot of materials research in their back pocket. We have uh, 8,000 square feet of space. 4,000 of it is dedicated to just a traditional design studio. The other 4,000 is a shop where we uh, explore and experiment on materials. Um, so uh, we are doing this research concurrent with many projects, but we don't imagine that all research is gonna happen on the projects that we're working on at, the, at that time. And in fact, some of the concrete research that we did did not find itself into the house in Southern France. So it will be transported elsewhere. But I think that if you look uh, at the portfolio of experiments we've done in the last 20 years through the installation work and some of the Biennale works, you'll begin to see that uh, there's a wealth of knowledge that emerges from that, that we can then transport into different scenarios strategically. So it's been difficult. Um, there, there is no uh, easy answer, but I think uh, ambitious clients have come to learn that sometimes um, uh, that these things transform their identity to such a great degree that it becomes uh, of great worth to them. It's not just about the real estate, it's about something that happens in surplus to it. And so, uh, some of that finds its way, way into the work. And certainly the suspended studio in, in Melbourne was case in point. They had to value engineer the studio space out, out of the building entirely. So we transformed that studio space into the vertical arena and suspended that studio. And then all of a sudden came in within budget. Uh, the, the translation of a, of a liability into an asset was a win-win situation. And working with wood was relatively conventional and sustainable that it would uh, become uh, an obvious uh, avenue for the deployment of that project. And so there are moments like that, that um, it, it becomes a huge success. One thing that I, it's just a note, one thing that I found extremely inspiration as a, inspirational as a founder of my own studio was the way you explain those moments in your work to a point where it becomes almost unreasonable not to undertake this uh, experimentation or this moment of uh, uh, the project. Uh, we have a project here, uh, sorry, we have a question here by Nada Khaled, uh, who's asking, digital fabrication in a way encouraged uh, a return to the pre-Renaissance idea of architecture as a mechanical craft, uh, buildings made by artisan workers. Do you see the work of NAD Labs uh, as other than to experiment with design, a way to bypass budget limitations or to maintain a, a level of craft? How do you argue its value in the contemporary architecture office? Well, I, I don't think of uh, Nada's questions as questions. She has articulated uh, the, the multifaceted way in which NAD Lab works. It, it is a way to experiment with design. Uh, it, it is a way to bypass uh, budget limitations. 
it is a way to minimize tolerances to get uh, better craft. Um, uh, so its value uh, in great part is that it gives clients uh, the ability for customization uh, in, in a marketplace that still knows standardization as the benchmark of, of you know, the rational deployment of a project. Uh, and so uh, digital manufacturing, as we all know, uh, gives rise to the era of mass customization. And you know, the question is, uh, is not what its value is. Uh, the question now has become, what is, what is the decorum for the use of, now that you can build anything and everything that you want, why should you build it? There is still a question, should, just because you can do something, does it mean you should do it? And so I think what the, the key thing that we've had to confront in the last 10 years is not how to elaborate manner and exploit these things. It's also a question of how we can become better architectural critics curators and editors of our own work, mining out of what we do, the critical constraints that can become attendant to larger questions about how one deploys materials, uh, energy, uh, and a connection to the community that a, a project serves. And in that sense, you can see the, these latest projects, whether with higher or lower uh, budgets, with a sense of ethic that runs through them about how you best use architecture as an instrument um, in, 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 in confrontation and in dialogue with uh, uh, the clients and its uh, inhabitants. Great. Uh, Nadir, thank you so much for your time. I know you're, uh, you have a meeting after this. I really appreciate the time you put into this and uh, to, to present your brilliant work to our audience. I appreciate the connection to yourself and I hope we stay in touch. Thank you so much. Great pleasure being here with you.